the Etruscans were a relatively small culture, very similar to that of the Scythians and Sarmatians. They, along with Genghis Khan, provide some of the most striking evidence showing that the stories that we have been told in school about the so-called history have actually less truth in them than the bad time stories for children. And indeed the bad time stories have a much higher educational intrinsic value because at least they tell about the times when magicians and giants were walking the earth and that unlike the stories that we read in the history books was something that actually happened. Adriano Loregina is the president of the National Institute of Archaeology of Italy. He says, it is a universally accepted fact nowadays that the Etruscans were the founders of Rome and their role in uh, forming the full Italian uh, antique culture is enormous. In the beginning, Rome itself had three Etruscan emperors. And yet further, he assures us that nobody knows where the Etruscans came from and their writing is absolutely unreadable. Then he was asked the following question, why exactly the Etruscan is unreadable? After all, similar looking writings are uh, translated without any problem. What is the problem exactly with the Etruscan? And he says, there is uh, no problem actually reading it, that the alphabet and the sounds are completely readable. And they are very similar to the ancient Greek alph alphabet and few other ancient alphabets. However, the only problem is that we don't know the meaning of the words. That's why we consider this language undecipherable. But is that really true? It was a couple of centuries ago that the Italian professor Sebastian Ciampi happened to work in the University of Vashon, and because he was in a Slavic country, he picked up a little bit of Polish language. Much to his great surprise, even with only a very minimal amount of simple Polish language, he started not only reading Etruscan inscriptions, but also understanding the text. Upon his return to Italy, he was happy to share his discovery with his Italian colleagues. However, they simply refused to even take a look at his work, because they said that the most authoritative and learned German scholars had already long ago established what the history was like, and so this cannot be true. And it cannot be, because it cannot be. And he was not alone. Other scholars discovered the same, like Tadeusz Walansky and Alexander Chertkov. This is a comparison table compiled by... Uh, Walansky of the Etruscan alphabet. In the first column you see the Etruscan letters and in the second column you see the Cyrillic counterparts. Both alphabets bear great resemblance. <laughs> Here are a few examples. Look at this sample Etruscan ins inscription that uh, comes first in the mainstream history book on the Etruscans written by Ulrich Friedrich Koppa. In his book, he loudly assures us that uh, Etruscan is absolutely unreadable forever. He doesn't even discuss this inscription in his full book. This is how you read the inscription. Стерила купида ранит минифеи. Now I myself don't know any ancient Slavic language. I only know contemporary Slavic languages. And yet I hear in plain speech without the need of any translation the way the Etruscans wrote it hundreds of years ago that the arrows of Cupid will wound or are wounding the nymph. It really sounds to me like some sort of dialect from a remote village area. It doesn't sound like a foreign language at all. 
Not only I see letters which are familiar to me, which I can read. Not only I can understand what's going on by hearing what is written, but it also fully corresponds to the picture of Cupid shooting his arrows at the female. And they're telling me this is unreadable? And here is another one. It says, Rvit svyam nit. Without the need of any translation or interpretation, any Slavic person would understand that it is something about a lion. And sure enough, the picture resembles that as well. So, the Catholic Church became aware that the people would easily figure out the stories that they were representing as history. And that is why the fate of Mr. Velasky was not an easy one. Not only did they declare his books as heresy and started hunting them down and burning them, but they also sentenced him to death. And it was only by the endeavors of a certain emperor that he eventually managed to escape. Instead of actual historic research based on ancient inscriptions, the mainstream historians always quote Theodor Mommsen and others like him. He wrote other correct history of Rome and it is always said and quoted that it was based on hundreds of old books from all these sources and all that and he had them at home and he compiled them all and always the same trick. After he finished his work, all of a sudden all this fire devoured everything and not even a single one of these books is left now. So how did the Etruscans look like? Of course, the official answer is like the way people in Italy look nowadays, because they are descendants of the Etruscans. But on the old frescoes we see a completely different situation, along with the usual blonde Scandinavian looking people, we see also people of color. And they are not some slaves, as they are telling us, actually the servant is blonde. The boss is of darker complexion. I mean, everything they're telling us is wrong. About the language, about who the people were, just everything. Actually, the Etruscans were a very international crowd. And this fits very well with the story of the survivors. We saw the same record in America. In Popova, they were telling us about the people who came to teach them from far away. They all spoke different languages, and they looked different. We find traces of Chinese people in the survivors team, along with the traces of Africans, which are much better known and much more numerous in the Americas. If we look at the Etruscan art without any bias, we'll see that it is practically the same thing what they call Greco-Roman art, Scythian, Sarmatian, you can search for such images. They are identical, Dacian, Thracian. And yet all those are classified not only as a completely separate cultures, but even they call them different civilizations. What a heavy word to make us think that we were all separate. The Scottish scholar Thomas Dempster compiled a meticulous study of the Etruscans published in a couple of big volumes, compilation of ancient work showing that it was the Etruscans who gave to the full region of uh, Rome and full Italy uh, technology, medicine, agriculture and basically all culture and knowledge. As everywhere else on earth, they simply came to educate people. 
But how did the Etruscans call themselves? The name they used is Racena, that is well accepted even by mainstream historians. Do you remember the quote from Mavro Orbini? He also said that the survivors called themselves Racenami, which means the scattered ones. And that is why he continues various nations derived their names from this word. Another nation that did that is the Russians. It is not a secret that they call themselves Rusi. That, that's how it sounds in their language. As, and it was formed by... Uh, the, and the root of that was Rasayanami. For example, in this Etruscan inscription, they talk about Russia using the main, very main word that is historically well known to signify Russia, and that is Russia. And that is, by the way, how the Russian people themselves till nowadays call their country Russia. The land that was founded by the scattered ones. By the way, Etruscans, the very word, as it is in English, may not sound as close to Russians, but that's only in English. In uh, the Slavic language, it sounds like this, Etruskie. It is very near to Ruskie, almost the same. It doesn't mean that the Etruscans are Russians. It means that both regions, that of Italy and that of Russia, initially received their culture from these scattered ones. And also please note that since Etruskie and Ruskie is very near in the Slavic language, it must have, it probably has been even at the time when the Etruscans were speaking their own language because it was basically a Slavic language. According to even official statistics, the most common family name in Italy till date is Rossi. And of course, as everywhere else on earth, the swastika was their symbol. Here is what everybody calls a Roman style helmet, it's actually Etruscan. Here are the Etruscan sphinxes. Everything was there already, nothing was invented by the Romans. The Etruscan uh, laurel, right? When the official history there was being cooked up and fabricated, the appearance of the Etruscans made them uncomfortable. They weren't supposed to be there, after all. All these inventions and all the knowledge they gave was accredited mistakenly to the Romans. So what to do with them? As usual, just throw them into the far away unimportant part. Centuries before Christ. But in fact, in the main book of the Etruscans, although we don't have an original version, we only had the corrected by the Jesuit monks form, Still, even in its corrected form, it just copies the Bible. It resembles the Bible very closely. In fact, the Etruscans flourished just centuries ago. The cross is present in their artwork, the Christian cross. They knew very well about Christ. And the mainstream historians are telling us that they are working hard on solving this mystery of why the main Etruscan book resembles the Bible so closely, they're working so hard and... Surprise, surprise, there's no explanation yet. It is still a mystery. And by the way, the very name of that uh, main book of theirs can tell us quite a lot. It is called Sudne Kniga. And again, I don't know any ancient... Uh, European languages, and yet I understand this just because I know Slavic languages. It means simply Book of Law. Very strange. The, they, they have even made up a proverb saying Etruscan unreadable in uh, Italian. 
to really convince people and they always underline with such bold letters that Etruscan is absolutely unreadable and will never be readable and it is a mystery and all that and yet uh, millions of people who know Slavic languages can understand without any translation interesting is this just another african or is uh, some other chap of uh, the blue ones there in uh, egypt the blue ones also in india krishna belonged to the blue race also the time of the first new expedition to italy we had an art historian in the group and when she saw some uh, depictions murals of some angels they were so masculine they looked uh, like modern cartoons she immediately exclaimed this is either a modern uh, mural or this was not two three thousand years old as it was written on the tourist board in front of this uh, burial chamber and it seems that uh, those images you can see them in the video report of the expedition were not modern addition by the restoration team because uh, also on their statues we see very uh, realistic depiction of the muscles which was uh, definitely not uh, typical in the art which is uh, as they say 2000 years old and even more here is another very muscular angel and not just the people also here the horses the muscles are very well pronounced and all this art you see now it's uh, etruscan there are so many personalities from the Bible stories. We see devils, Christian looking angels. I can't say for sure when did the Etruscans thrive exactly, but surely it was the era after Christ. So, to summarize, the Etruscans are just an excellent example of how unnecessary mystification is used to cover up the real history and cover up the biggest of all mysteries, which is how descendants of magicians like ourselves have been tricked into believing to be descendants of apes. <laughs>